Back when I was just six years old, my family home was subjected to a home invasion that was straight up like something out of a horror movie. I don't actually remember too much about it, and for that I'm extremely grateful, but my sister is five years older than me and remembers enough to still kind of be traumatized by it, and obviously my parents can recall every little detail, so most of what I'm about to tell you comes from their memories, not my own. From what my dad has told me, the home invader didn't break in because he wanted to rob us. He broke in because he was a violent schizophrenic who just wanted to hurt someone. My dad said that he could hear the guy before he actually tried to break in, screaming in our front yard about how he was going to kill our whole family. So by the time he actually smashed one of the front windows and climbed in, my dad was ready for him. It took a few minutes from his arrival to him actually breaking in, and in that time, my mom gathered up my sister and I, then we hid in the hallway bathroom. And that's my only real memory of it. One minute I was playing Legos, and the next, my mom was scooping me up and carrying me to the bathroom. I knew something was wrong, just from the way she and my sister were acting. I just didn't know exactly what was going on. My dad says that when he actually faced the guy down, it was horrifying because he saw how huge he actually was. He says the guy was maybe only an inch or two below seven feet, with his big barrel chest and tree trunks for arms. Not only that, but he's holding a snow shovel, presumably what he used to smash out our front window. My mom called the cops as soon as we heard screaming in the front yard, but we later found out the cops accidentally drove past our house while they were looking for the address. This meant my dad was holding back, expecting them to arrive at any second, but Little did he know, he was completely on his own. He said he took a position on the stairs and just waited for the guy to walk into the hallway and spot him. When he did, my dad says the guy just locked eyes with him, then stares him down for a few seconds. My dad starts to give him a warning about how he'll shoot if he gets any closer, but the guy doesn't even let him finish. He just started running for the stairs, right at my dad, and the loaded gun pointed at him. He gave my dad no choice but to open fire, and he opened up with three shots from his 9 mil. but the way my dad tells it, that was probably the most scared he was all night because the shots from his 9 just did absolutely nothing at all. I remember hearing the shots as I hugged my mom and how she kind of whimpered with fear after they rang out. The guy was so off his rocker that he barely even felt the bullets hitting him and just kept yelling stuff as he started swinging at my dad with a shovel. My dad then starts backing up the stairs, trying to dodge the guy's swing, but he ends up falling backwards on the stairs just as he's trying to take another shot at the guy's head and ends up missing. The guy then gets another good swing on my dad with a shovel and ends up knocking the gun out of his hands. My dad thought that he was going to try and grab the gun, but he must not have noticed that he'd knocked it out of his hands because he just kept swinging at my dad with the shovel. My dad then kicks out at the guy, and this throws him off balance a little, resulting in him just tumbling down the stairs. The sound is one of the only things I really remember from back then, because I thought it was my dad that might have fallen, and that had me just bawling in fear. Meanwhile, my dad said the guy fell downstairs in such a horrible way that he thought that he was dead at first. You gotta keep in mind that my dad started roughly in the center of the stairs, then retreated almost to the top when he got rushed. So, when he kicked out at the psycho guy, he had a long way to fall down before he hit the bottom. And when he did, my dad said that he just laid there, completely still, and didn't even look like he was breathing. First thing my dad does is retrieve his gun from the stair it was lying on. But obviously it's lying about two-thirds of the way down the stairs, so as he's taking slow, careful steps down them, He's got his eye on the unconscious psycho, just waiting for him to open his eyes and start rushing him again. Luckily, that didn't happen. My dad was able to retrieve his gun before keeping a train on the guy until the cops finally showed up. The guy was just out for the count, and he didn't wake up again until he was cuffed to an ambulance stretcher with the cops riding along with him. This next part is the thing that still really creeps me out, even all these years later. From what I understood, 
my dad spent an awful lot of time dealing with these same two cops who were investigating the break-in. He said they were totally on his side from the get-go and super helpful when it came down to keeping him up to date with all the home invaders' charges and hearings and stuff. They told my dad the guy's name, which was Richard something, and told them that he was from the next town over, which is like a three hours drive away. They knew what his job had been, all of his criminal history, but when it came to the motive, they had no idea why the guy had targeted my dad, since he'd never met the guy before in his life. At one point, the cops told my dad that they only knew one thing about the guy's state of mind when he decided to break into our house. They said that while the guy was cuffed to the stretcher on the way to the hospital, he came to. He was obviously woozy and was barely getting any sense, but the cop riding with him starts asking him all these questions, have to get some info out of him, and have to just keep him awake. Keeping in mind that he's lost a fair bit of blood from the gunshot wounds and he was in such a bad way that the cops didn't think that he was going to survive his stay at the hospital. Only, he does. The guy somehow pulls through, gets transferred to a jail hospital, and he's subject to a full psych evaluation when he's well enough to talk. One of the questions that he was asked was why he brought a shovel along with him while breaking into our house. I heard the goal of the question is to get the guy to prove intent, to get him to admit to wanting to do harm, not just that he happened to be digging a ditch at the time of the attack or whatever. But he goes a bunch of layers deeper and replies with something like, I wanted to be able to bury them after I killed them. The guy didn't even really want to hurt anyone, but he somehow got into his head that the voices would stop if he sacrificed something to them, something along those lines anyway, like a blood tribute. And we just happened to be the unlucky family that he picked that night, as he wandered through our neighborhood after having wandered like over a hundred miles or so from his home. Like I said earlier, Guy turned out to be a complete fruit loop with multiple personality disorders, but primarily, it was the paranoid schizophrenia that actually pushed him over the edge into violence. He's still interred at some psych hospital out of state, I think, and the cops have to let us know if he ever gets conditionally released. But for now, I don't think we're going to just run into the guy at the HEB anytime soon. Honestly, I'm glad I was too young to really remember what happened. It's still the scariest event of my childhood by far, but I didn't end up having to go to therapy like my older sister did. She couldn't sleep properly for weeks after the break-in and kept having nightmares about strangers breaking into our house and murdering us in our beds. Dad became a total home defense nut after that whole thing too, which, like my sister and her nightmares, is understandable. I just think it's sad that one little night almost 25 years ago changed our whole family for the worse. Mom and Dad got the bullet holes in the hallway patched up, they installed cameras, they bought more guns and bear spray and all sorts of other stuff, but I don't think it changes the fact that they're still scared. I don't think they feel any safer. They'll just be more prepared if something like that happens again. And I pray every day that none of us ever have to go through something that traumatic, ever again. This happened in NYC. Years ago when I was a freshman in college, I was out partying one night with some friends. I wasn't drunk or on any hard drugs, but I definitely smoked a blunt or two. Around 3am we went our separate ways and I got off the train and began walking home. I had to take a longer route home that night because some train lines were under maintenance. When I got off the train I realized that I had walked past the cemetery and started to feel uneasy but I wasn't afraid for any real reason. About 10 blocks and I'm home. I always saw trucks lined up on the cemetery blocks and being that it was a desolate area, I assumed truckers would park their trucks by the cemetery to take naps or sleep before continuing their routes. Back then I thought nothing of it. A few minutes after getting off the train, I heard a faint sound of what I guess was a car or truck door being shut behind me. I turned around and saw nothing. I scanned my surroundings once quickly and didn't see one other person ahead or behind me for as far as I could see. I keep walking, this time a bit faster, and 
About a minute later, I hear footsteps behind me. I turned so quick and saw a man walking fast a few feet behind me. When he saw me turn, he began catcalling me by making these weird kissing noises. I was used to these catcalls, especially living in NYC. By my house, there used to be a line of men on the corner every morning, waiting to be picked up for construction work, and every time I passed them to go to the store, I would get catcalled and harassed. So I ignored him and kept walking, but definitely faster this time. A few seconds later, he was running to catch up with me, and he was now at my side, speaking to me in Spanish, which I don't speak. He grabbed my arm tightly and began pulling me toward him when I started screaming and fighting him off. He pushed me up against the cemetery fence, and in the midst of this, my heart sunk to the floor as I thought that things were about to get real bad. Seconds later, he had me off my feet by both arms, and his face turned white in the moonlight, a face of pure horror as he looked past me into the cemetery, fixated on something. He just let out a blood-curdling scream and let me go. As I dropped to the floor, he was already across the street and running out of sight. I was choking on tears, shaking and just beside myself. I picked myself up and ran so fast the last few blocks to my house. I didn't turn to look inside that cemetery once. I didn't turn around at all. I didn't stop until I was home. I never took that train or walked past that cemetery again, and to be honest, I never told my parents and only told a handful of friends over the years because, to this day, I still don't understand what happened. But something saved my life. At the time of the story, I was 21 and living in a major Midwestern city, attending the university there. Having lived there for only a month before my story began, I had witnessed a train stop stabbing, been yelled at by a crackhead, had a homeless guy follow me and threatened to choke me outside the physics building on campus, and watched a 13-car cop raid on a drug house just across the street. The area around the university is known for being rough and had a notoriously high rate of crime. We would get a few texts a week from the campus police saying things like there had been a robbery, a break-in, an assault, stockings, attempted kidnappings, etc. And I always ignored these texts, thinking foolishly that I would never be a victim because I was smart enough to stay out of trouble, not go out alone late at night, all the cliches. I seriously regret this behavior now, and to anyone listening to this, please never think that you're 100% safe no matter your level of preparedness. Always do your best to stay observant and careful. The first incident wasn't too unusual. I was just a block or two from my apartment building one day in the early evening. It was still light outside. I was walking my dog Sesame, a cute Shiba Inu who just looks like a fluffy, goofy puppy and has never been frightening or particularly protective in his life. As I was heading back home, I passed a small parking lot and in it, a large van. I could see a man in his maybe early 60s sitting in the driver's seat smoking a cigarette. He was staring at me. As I passed, he actually leaned out of his car and called out to me. Hey, you there. It's a cute dog. What's his name? I should mention this isn't even my first story like this. I have a pretty intense fear of strangers and actually struggle with PTSD from other incidents in my life. Being pretty wary for this reason, I ignored him and just walked faster. I heard a car door shut behind me and turned quickly to see that he had gotten out of his van and was slowly walking towards me. He called out to me again. Hey, baby, I just want to see your dog. Come back. This phrasing made me angry, and I gripped my dog's leash and started to speed walk away from him, starting to feel nervous. My heart was beginning to pound, but I kept telling myself over and over that I was overreacting. It was just my paranoia acting up and there was nothing to worry about. But boy, was I wrong. I managed to turn the corner and was about to cross the final park before getting to my apartment. In my fear over the van guy, I wasn't paying attention as much as I usually do to what was in front of me. I looked back over my shoulder and the guy had stopped following me. 
He was, however, standing in the middle of the sidewalk with a huge, creepy grin on his face. I whirled back around with my eyes glued to my building. I only needed to walk for another half a block and I'd be home. I was going to get away from him and his creepy van. And just when I thought I was safe, a group of five or six men came from the side of the park that I wasn't watching. They were all tall and intimidating in stature and all of them were laughing and looking right at me. Out of the corner of my eye, the van guy had started walking towards me as well. I remember he was whistling. I again picked up my pace and desperately searched for my keys in my pocket as I hurried to the door. The group of men then veered towards me, partially cutting me off, and in all my stupid politeness, I stopped. They grinned at me with sick, perverted smiles, obviously checking me out, looking up and down my body, and it made me sick. I tried not to panic an inch closer to my apartment. Hey, what's your name? Where you going? What's your Snapchat? Is that your apartment? Can we come over? Do you smoke? They all barraged me with questions one after another. I tried to refuse them, stammering, D no, no thank you. As I saw the van guy come and join their group, leering at me. While I inched away, they inched closer. One of them reached out for me, his fingers actually touching my arm. I leapt back, trying not to start crying, but Sesame suddenly lunged at them, his teeth barred, a horrifying snarl ripping from his throat. Every bit of cute Shiva personality was gone, and he looked like he wanted to tear one of these guys' throats out. It startled them enough that I was able to turn and sprint the final distance to my building, locking the door behind me. I fell to the floor inside my building, hugging Sesame. However, the entire front of my building was glass, and to my horror and disbelief, the group of men came and stood in front of the windows, grinning at me, laughing and making kissy faces and lewd gestures at me. The apartment manager came out and called the cops on them, but they ran away. I made it back home and scrubbed myself in the shower, crying and shaking with fear. Sesame got a special dinner that evening, and... I kept telling myself that they just wanted to mess with me and I was never in any real danger. Stupid of me, I know now. About a month later, when I had finally managed to be able to walk outside of my apartment without severe anxiety, I was actually planning on moving a bit further away from campus. It was still going to be in a sketchy neighborhood, but the thought of those men knowing where I lived kept me up at night. My apartment actually hired a security guard to be there 24-7 after someone had broken into the building, smashed all the windows, destroyed some of the furniture, and stole a bunch of bikes. Of course, my bike got stolen. Anyways, I was headed home from class, and it was a beautiful day. I actually felt pretty happy for once and popped my earbuds in on the last few blocks before I got home. Silly move. After a block or so, I started to feel like someone was watching me. My palms started sweating. I glanced behind me, trying not to look obvious, and a tall man was about 20 feet behind me, starting straight at me. I snapped my head back around and ripped out my earbuds. No, 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 I thought. It can't be one of them. I was just jumping to conclusions given my anxiety disorder and paranoia, surely, but there was something familiar about him. My heart started racing as I hoped to God the others weren't waiting for me around the corner of my building ready to jump me. I walked faster, wishing Sesame was with me. I was too afraid to look back at him as I fumbled with my keys and wrenched the front door as hard as I could, and this turned out to be a crucial mistake. As I ran to the elevator, trying to breathe a sigh of relief, I saw with absolute horror that the man had caught the door that I had thrown wide open and was slowly coming into the building with me. He paused, standing away from me but close enough that I could hear his ragged breath and smelling alcohol coming off of him. My heart was thudding in my chest now and I struggled to think clearly. The apartment manager was already home for the day and I was completely alone in the lobby. There were no other doors out of the room and the stranger was blocking my way to the door. The security guard was supposed to be keeping an eye on the building was nowhere to be seen. The elevator came and I tried running into it and slammed my hand over the door close button as fast as I could. I pushed my floor button and huddled into the far corner of the elevator. I started to once again try to catch my breath, but right when the door was almost closed, he stuck his hand in. 
I couldn't believe it. He waited until the door was just about to close, and then he stopped it. He was standing close enough that there was no way that was a mistake. My stomach dropped, and a suffocating sense of dread crept in. I kept my head down as he joined me. My desperate hope that he was just a dirty drunken resident of the building was dashed when he didn't press any buttons. I don't know why I didn't run out of the elevator or try to leave the building again. I was paralyzed with fear, and all I could do was watch as the door closed and sealed my fate. The elevator was filled with the stench of alcohol and B.O. If I wasn't so terrified, I may have gagged. It was nauseating. I couldn't look at him. I couldn't move. I tried to scream at myself in my head to press the wrong button and to try to escape, but I was completely petrified. He leaned closer to me and I heard him breathe in deeply and very quietly sigh, like he was content. I felt tears well up in my eyes and the seconds it took to reach the top floor where I lived felt like hours. I saw no way that I could escape the sick, drunk guy who was smelling me. In the reflection of the elevator walls, I could make out this disgusting smile. He was staring directly at me, his hands in his pockets, clearly holding onto something. I'm not religious, but I prayed that I would make it to my door in time. I realized that he probably wasn't going to attack me in the elevator. There was a large camera in the ceiling. I looked up at it. Feeling a tear spill out of my eye as I did so, hoping that whoever saw the tape eventually would identify this man. The worst part of all of this is that I've trained in martial arts and self-defense since I was about 8 years old. I thought of myself as stronger and braver than I was acting. I should know what to do. I should be strong enough to do it. But no matter how many times I had disarmed, thrown, or choked out attackers in the studio... Nothing totally prepares you for the dread of a real-life situation. As the elevator reached my floor, I managed to snap out of my stupor long enough to dash to the door and run to my apartment unit. I nearly missed the keyhole, but I threw open my door. I was nearly through when my backpack snagged on the outside handle of the door, trapping me. I heard the man walking quickly to my door, a low chuckle building in his throat as he watched me panic and struggle to get free. I felt like a mouse being watched by a cat, trapped and helpless, so close to escaping. I finally gave and shoved my arms to the straps, abandoning my backpack. As I did so, the man suddenly reached out for me. I was able to slam the door shut, deadbolting it, and the gust of air from the door slamming brought his disgusting smell in with me, and in my terror and disgust I retched violently. I looked through the peephole. He was staring right at me, pressing his forehead against the door, his mouth bent in a furious scowl. He swore at me and ripped my backpack off the handle of the door, slamming it to the ground. I winced as I heard my laptop thud, and I was still too terrified to say anything, but I grabbed the knife that I kept by my door in my hand, ready if he tried anything. After a few minutes of staring at my door, jiggling the handle, licking the peephole, and making obscene motions at it, he unzipped my backpack, dumping its contents on the floor. He picked up my bag, sniffing it and leering at the peephole as he did so, like he knew that I was watching him. I couldn't look away, again paralyzed in fear. Finally he left, using the elevator visible from my door like nothing had happened. I continued to stare out the peephole for what felt like an eternity and then finally called the apartment manager, feeling my anger sinking in that the security guard hadn't been anywhere in sight, not paying attention. It turned out that he had fallen asleep eating Taco Bell and watching movies on his phone. He was only 10 feet away from the elevator the entire time, sleeping in the office behind a closed door. They fired him, but the creepy guy was never caught, and neither were any of the others. I don't even know for sure if this man was part of the original group, I was honestly too terrified to look much at their faces during the first incident. I moved out of my apartment a week later, staying with my boyfriend at the time for the remainder of my lease and keeping Sesame with me at all times when possible. A few more things happened while I lived in that city, from having to call in a gunfight from outside my new apartment window, to having to pick up my friend who was being followed by a van, to having to evacuate during an arson incident. 
There are nice things about that city too, but during my time there, besides learning the police department was absolutely useless and corrupt to nearly escaping with my life multiple times, I couldn't be happier to be far, far away from there and doing a lot better with my fear and anxiety. I was followed today, and I honestly can say that I don't think I've ever had something scare me so bad. I live on a military base in Europe, and two days ago I found out that I was pregnant and had to go get a blood test to confirm when I walked into the waiting room there was a man that made eye contact with me that I assumed was waiting on another patient. I waited for about ten minutes and the man kept getting up to get magazines from a coffee table right in front of me. He came over like five times in ten minutes. I go to get my blood test. I'm excited and I decided to go get some celebratory tea and a breakfast sandwich at a place about ten minutes down the road, still on base. When I'm standing in line, I notice the same man walk into the establishment and look around like he's looking for someone. He spots me and makes a beeline straight to me and stands in line behind me. I'm feeling nervous now. I order my food and sit at a table quickly because I don't want him to follow me to my car. He gets his food and sits at a table directly in front of me and keeps trying to catch my eye and smile. After about five minutes, he then gets up and sits at my table and I ask him, What are you doing? And he looks at me and says, How far along are you? Women like you always smell like milk so early in pregnancy. I yelled. I immediately yelled, telling him to get the F away from me. And security came and removed him. And he tried telling security that I was his wife and I had memory issues. I explained what happened to security and the guard walked me to my car so I could go home without him following me. I told my husband when I got back home and we switched cars just for extra safety in case the man went looking for my vehicle. Please people, be safe out here. People are ridiculous. My story takes place when I was 15 years old. A lot of people would have considered 15 year old me conventionally very pretty. I had long dark brown straight hair, freckles, tan skin and bright blue eyes. This day, my mom and I are in Dillard's looking for a particular type of shirt that I needed for school. Lucky me, I went to a public school that required uniforms and our school colors were very common so a lot of the more affordable stores had been picked clean. I would consider Dillard's to attract a certain type of customer most of the time, mostly little old ladies that smell like powder, but I guess creeps can be anywhere. My mom and I are going from rack to rack trying to find school shirts when I notice a man nearby. I glance up at him and he was staring at me, smiling. He was probably in his mid-thirties, very tan with shiny black hair. I looked away and continued searching for clothes. I guess my mom had noticed him too because I could feel that she was tense standing next to me. We calmly walked to a rack further away to see if he would follow, and he did. He kept a little distance, but his eyes stayed locked on me and he continued smiling. He must have watched and followed us for at least 20 minutes. My mom tested him again and we continued to another rack once more, and he followed. This time he came up directly to us and spoke to my mom. Is that your daughter? My mom coldly told him yes. She's very beautiful. A princess. Mama gave him a sharp, thank you, and went to pull me away. He reached for me and shouted, I'd like to buy her. I'd like to buy your gorgeous daughter. I'll take her with me and give her everything she ever wanted. All while still trying to grab my arm. I kept taking steps backwards, but he continued advancing towards me, staring into my eyes, still talking about making me a princess at his palace. It was all happening so fast. Suddenly, mama bear mode kicked in and like lightning, she pulled me behind her to get between me and the man. She pretty much chest bumped him backwards, and through gritted teeth she hissed at him that if he valued his life, he'd leave the store, get in his car and drive away. 
He tried to protest once, but my mom roared, leave, and his eyes got huge, and he fell into a rack of khaki pants trying to get away. We immediately left the store, and in the safety of the car, my mama broke down in tears. I don't remember even being afraid while everything was happening. I was ready to put up the fight of my life, but looking at the tears on my mom's face made me realize exactly how dangerous that situation was. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. This encounter took place a few blocks from my house at around 1am about a year ago. I'm 6 foot 2, so I'm not used to people wanting to mess with me to be honest. My puppy was full of energy so I was going to take him for a walk to try to tire him out while my girlfriend drove to the gas station to get a snack or something. A few blocks from our place, I see our car stop at the street corner. I can't see anything in the car, but I just assumed that my girlfriend saw our puppy and I and wanted to say hi and check on us. So as I get closer, the passenger side window rolls down, and thinking it's my girlfriend, I approach the car. Instead of being greeted by my lady, I hear a man say, Hey, sexy. I laugh a little at first, thinking that she ran into an old friend at the gas station was giving a ride and they're just messing with me. I admit I was a little bit high on ketamine, so I was taking a second to process the situation. The man asks if I wanted to hang out with him, and I politely say no thanks. And then he says, I bet you got a big dinghy in between them sweatpants. I told him that he's effing nasty and that I'm not into that sort of stuff. The dude then offers me $120 to get in his car with him. I said, yeah, not chance, I'm not like that man. And I decide the little guy and I need to get away from this guy and I start to power walk past his car and I had a really bad feeling about this dude. He then tells me, get in this car right now. And the pup and I dip out of there and head back for home. Dude got out of his car for a second before getting back in his car and taking off. We went around the block before the car rolled up again, and I figured that I couldn't outrun him, so I was ready to fight. When the window rolled down, it was my girlfriend asking if we needed a ride, which she never does. We hopped in her car, and I started bawling my eyes out. I couldn't even explain what happened until we were home. My girlfriend said that something told her to check on us. I believe this guy may have wanted to possibly kidnap me. It was frightening, and it gave me a whole new appreciation for what women go through all the time. I've quibbled with the thought of publicly sharing my story for a while now. Recently, I've arrived at a place where I think the benefit of sharing outweighs the risk. People can be so judgmental. So I'm taking a chance and just putting it out there, and maybe it'll help someone. Many times I've looked back on the odd events leading up to the scariest night of my life, October 5th, 2015. I'd like to say that I did everything right, but honestly in hindsight I should have done more. I am convinced that my son, who was three and a half at the time, actually saved me from harm that night. I could have easily become another statistic in the crime database. Although my stalker didn't hurt me physically, it took me months to get past the psychological damage. And here is my story. In May 2012, I temporarily exited the workforce following the birth of my son Chris. He was born with a physical birth defect that would require multiple corrective surgeries during his first year of life. He was also born two and a half months early, which had complicated things further. NICUs are no fun. Chris's father, Aaron, agreed that I should stay home with our son until he was one years old, considering the circumstances. In May 2013, I felt comfortable enough to leave my son with a babysitter, so I went job hunting. I ended up being hired on the spot as a waitress at a small but very popular chain restaurant in my little town. Let's just say that this little diner is widely known for waffles, and we'll just leave it at that. I was hired on to work second shift the newbie shift because it was not as busy. After two months, I had worked my way up to first shift. The breakfast shift is the moneymaker. By the summer of 2014, 
I had long built out a clientele of regular customers that enjoyed my service and tipped me quite well, enough for me to have a little put back in the savings, which came in handy when Aaron and I broke up, which was not an amicable split at first. I ended up moving out of our apartment with Chris and renting a small two-bedroom trailer in the same town. It was mid-November of 2014 when I first met Ryan, the man who would later stalk me. It was an abnormally slow Saturday morning shift at the diner. Two men, one late 40s, early 50s, and the other maybe early 20s, walked into the diner together and sat down in my section. They were my only customers at the time, so when the older man of the two started making small talk, I had the time. The older man introduced himself to me as Ryan, and the younger man with him was his son. Right away, by his body language and tone, I could tell Ryan was being flirtatious with me. He even cracked a cliché joke saying, There's no way you work here because you're too pretty. You have all your teeth. Honestly, I wasn't super amused with that tired kind of humor. I had heard it a million times over by then. And while Ryan was decent in looks department, I'd even venture to say semi-attractive, I was a little annoyed with being casually hit on by him. I was 25 years old at the time and much closer to his son's age. But nevertheless... I faked merriment because a happy customer equals a better tip. It's just part and parcel to the job. Suffice it to say, my fake laughing and smiling paid off, earning me a $10 tip on a $20 ticket. They were only there for 30 minutes too. Not too bad, I thought to myself. The following weekend, Ryan came back to the diner. This time, and every subsequent time thereafter, he came alone. There was nothing unusual about this interaction than from the last... I took his order, we chit-chatted when I had time, I kept his coffee refilled and that was it. But apparently he enjoyed his experience because, again, he left me a nice $12 tip on an $8 ticket. Ryan began visiting the diner every weekend from then on up until the end of December. By then, he had started coming two to three times per week, and at this point, he really started showing an interest in getting to know me. Now, that's not something unusual per se, I had some other regulars that I actually developed friendships with, some even getting me Christmas gifts and such. So I did tell him things about myself in casual conversation during his visits. Just normal things that normal people talk about. One of the things I eventually told him about was the medical miracle that is my son. I even bragged about the fantastic job his doctors did, showing him the before and after photos of his surgeries. Over those past several weeks, Ryan's attitude toward me had changed. He was no longer this annoying, flirty, middle-aged guy, but rather a seemingly caring person. Maybe I was naive, but I genuinely appreciated his kindness and I did not interpret it as a romantic gesture at all. Ryan continued coming by on my shifts for breakfast three times a week. February 2015 is when the first strange event occurred, which was soon followed by a string of more. It was a Tuesday afternoon. I had picked Chris up from the babysitter and was headed home from work. Now, where I lived was on a small uphill dead-end road. As you pulled onto my road from the main highway, you could easily see my trailer on the right side at the top of the hill. It was positioned perpendicular to the road and the back side of it is visible as you drive up the road. As I eased my way up the hill, something immediately caught my eye. I could clearly tell my back door was open. I put the brakes on immediately and tried to figure out what to do. I literally never touched or unlocked that door, much less opened it, so I knew something was off. A door is not going to unlock and open all by itself, and I ended up parking my car off to the side of the road and calling Aaron. At this point, we were on good terms and co-parenting our son very well. Aaron came straight over and checked out my trailer while I remained back in my vehicle with Chris. About five minutes after entering, he called me and told me that it was all clear. Again, it's a pretty small trailer. So I made my way up the hill, expecting to have been robbed or something. But nothing was missing. There was no damage to the door. And so Aaron basically brushed things off saying that I must have forgotten to close the door myself or something. I knew better, but since there was no sign of a breaking and entering, I let it go. Two days later on Thursday... I come home from work and the same thing. My back door is wide open. At this point, I know I'm not crazy. I know I had locked that damn door. 
It didn't have a deadbolt, by the way. It just had a lock on the doorknob that you turn. I had even tested it out that morning before work to make sure that it was locked. So I called Aaron again. I stayed parked with Chris on the side of the road while he did a quick pass through my trailer. Again, nothing out of the ordinary except my open back door. A quick inventory showed that nothing was missing. I was nervous at this point thinking that someone had broken in twice and Aaron disagreed. He attributed this problem to a faulty doorknob lock which made no sense to me and he then went to Lowe's and purchased a type of heavy duty swivel lock to install on the door that locked from the inside of my home. He wanted to put my mind at ease at least. So while he installed the lock, I combed through my house. I mean, I literally spent hours after Aaron left inspecting every nook and cranny of my trailer. The outlets, my shower head, vents, my panty drawer, etc. I thought that maybe some freak had broken in and planted secret cameras since they didn't take anything. I didn't find anything amiss, so I begrudgingly let it go. Two days after that, so on Saturday afternoon, I'm off work, heading uphill on the road towards my driveway. My son is spending the weekend with his dad, so I have the house to myself that evening. A wave of relief washes over me as I see that my back door is still closed. Now, I don't know why I decided to do this, but something compelled me to actually inspect the door up close. I needed to also make sure that it wasn't tampered with. To my horror, I discovered that it had. There were pry marks along the edge of the door jamb, and I immediately went inside and unlocked the door so I could open it and inspect further. The edge of the door was bent to hell, and back on the inside where the doorknob met the jamb. That damage wasn't there two days ago when Aaron installed that new lock. I deduced that someone had probably been using the credit card trick or something similar to easily break into that door since the way it locked was by the knob. And when they figured out that that would no longer work, they tried to pry it open, not knowing that a new lock was on the other side of the door. I'm thankful that lock held. At this point, I called the police and made a report. They basically told me that there wasn't much they could do in this instance other than document the incident. They told me to call them if anything else happened. Needless to say, that wasn't satisfactory to me, but I didn't know what else to do. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping at home that night, so I ended up making the hour drive to my parents' house and just crashing there. Nothing else happened for a little while. By March, I had been able to put February's events behind me and feel secure in my home again. I was working and going about life as usual. At this point, Brian had begun visiting the diner five days a week. Oddly enough, he was there each shift that I worked, and it became a running joke with the other waitresses and... In fun, they teased me about having a stalker. I would soon find out just how true that actually was. Because in April, things got weird. I came home from work one day to find my grass had been mowed. Now, I usually pay a neighbor to do it for me since I didn't have a lawnmower. My yard was small, but maintaining it was a requirement for my lease agreement. My neighbor didn't charge much to mow it, and he didn't need the extra cash, so it was a win-win. I knew I hadn't asked my neighbor to mow recently, so I thought that it was strange. I asked him if he went ahead and decided to do it anyway, and he said that he hadn't. So then I called my landlord and asked her if she had mowed my grass for some reason. Lee said that if it reaches a certain height, then she would mow it and charge me for it. I knew my grass hadn't been high enough to warrant that, but it was the only plausible explanation in my head. Of course, she said no. She hadn't mowed the grass and I was stumped. I then assumed that an anonymous neighbor must have mowed my grass out of the goodness of their heart. You know, like a pay-it-forward kind of thing. I mean, what else was I to think? All throughout April and the beginning of May, my grass was being anonymously mowed once per week. I know it sounds strange reading it, but at the time I genuinely thought a neighbor was just doing neighborly things and didn't want to be recognized for it. On May 5th, 2015, Aaron and I decided to take Chris to the zoo. When we get back from the zoo late that afternoon, we discovered that my front door was cracked open. Uh, Now, my front door did have a deadbolt, but I must have forgotten to lock it that day. How freaking stupid of me. 
You can imagine how upset I was due to my back door being tampered with multiple times back in February. I just didn't understand why this was happening again. Like all the other times, nothing was taken. My belongings seemed untouched. And yes, I was feeling targeted. But I didn't call the police because I felt like I technically had nothing to report. There was nothing stolen or vandalized, just an open front door. So I let it go. Two days later, I would discover the depth of things. May 7th, 2015. It was one of my rare days off. I was at home relaxing when the diner called me. I answered thinking maybe my boss wanted me to come into work. It wasn't my boss, but my co-worker, Celia. She stated that someone named Mary had called the diner asking to speak to me. Mary had asked for me by name. Since I wasn't at work that day, Mary left her phone number and requested that I call her as soon as possible. I thanked Celia for relaying the message and ended the call, feeling perplexed. I didn't know who Mary was, but out of curiosity I gave her a call. Mary ended up being Ryan's estranged wife, and I didn't even know that he was married. She informed me that Ryan had a nervous breakdown while they were arguing earlier. He started raving like a wild man about how my name is a better girlfriend than she is a wife. He told her that we were in love and that he had been taking care of me and my quote unquote, and this is him saying this, Down syndrome son for months. My son doesn't even have Down syndrome by the way and my son is not mentally impaired. I was incredibly offended by this when I heard this. She initially thought that it was all just crazy talk considering his mental state. He mentioned where I worked. He said that we were going to get married. He said that I had asked him to adopt my son. He said that he was going to run away with me in order to get away from her. He told her that he had started visiting me after following me home one day. When he said that, Mary knew that something was very wrong. Ryan had somewhat of a history with mental issues and Mary was used to him weaponizing things to hurt her feelings during arguments even if those things are complete lies. But she said this time was different. She knew he had started frequenting the diner and red flags went up for her when he admitted to following someone home. So she decided to call the diner to see if anyone by my name worked there. When Celia confirmed this, Mary perceived the possible danger and she left me her name and number requesting a call back. My head was spinning at this point. While things were finally starting to make sense, I was still gobsmacked. At one point in the conversation, Mary mentioned my grass being mowed. Yes, Ryan even flaunted the yard work that he did for me in her face. It was all very strange and very surreal. Basically, Ryan had been obsessing over me for months. He became delusional and it created a whole relationship between me and him and his mind. It was all in his head. And obviously... He was the one that was breaking into my home when I was gone, those visits. Why he did it, I still haven't pieced together 100%. He never took anything, and I imagine that he was mowing my grass because that was his little way of taking care of me. Anyway, by the end of the call, I decided to go to the police department in person to file a report about Ryan. I thought at the very least this is harassment and I needed it documented, Maybe I could get a restraining order. Mary offered to provide an official statement to the police as well, to which I thanked her, and the police department took our statements, and the harassment complaint was filed. Although I couldn't get a PO based off of my statement alone, I had no hard proof, the officer did assure me that he would personally go talk to Ryan. I then went straight to the diner to inform my boss, Chase, of the situation. Now, Chase took this very seriously. Just that morning, a third shift waitress actually brought up to Chase how a man came into the diner very early, around 4 a.m. This man was trying to get her to tell him which days that I would be working that week. She told Chase that it made her uncomfortable. So when I told Chase about Ryan, he went back and looked at the cameras from that morning. And sure enough, the man that was bothering the third shift for info about me was Ryan. So Chase initiated the process through corporate to get a permanent ban on Ryan from the diner, and it was approved at a later date. I was scheduled to work the following day, and I was nervous throughout my entire shift. But thankfully, Ryan didn't show up, nor did he show up the following day or the next day after that. 
all was quiet at home as well. The officer showed up at Ryan's house to speak with them and it must have spooked him enough to stop. Weeks and then months went by, no Ryan in sight, no vandalism at my home, no mysteriously mown grass, nothing. My life had gone completely back to normal. But things changed again in October. October 5th, 2015, it was around 8pm. My son Chris fell asleep on the couch while watching a movie. I had dozed off as well until I heard a few very light knocks at my front door. I then walked to the kitchen and looked out the only window that faces my driveway. No cars there except my own. So I figured the light tapping that I heard at my door was either just the TV or my half-asleep brain playing tricks on me. I then returned to the couch and started playing a game on my phone. About five minutes later, I heard a few light knocks on my door again. This time, I was wide awake so I knew my brain wasn't playing tricks. So I walked back over to my kitchen window to double check the driveway to see who was there. Again, my car was the only one in the driveway. And right as I go to close the kitchen window blinds, loud knocking suddenly erupts at my front door. I mean loud, angry banging. I guess my instincts kicked in and I sprinted to the couch. I scooped Chris up into my arms and ran down the hallway to his bedroom. I did the only thing I could think of in that fraction of a moment. He was groggy and confused, but he listened to my instructions of get under your bed, stay under your bed, and don't come out until I tell you. I then ran to my kitchen and grabbed a knife while dialing 911. I actually screamed at the door that I was calling the cops in hopes that it would scare them away. I positioned myself at the end of the hallway which connects my son's room to the living room. This way I'd have a clear view of both the front door in front of me and my son's bedroom door behind me. As the operator picked up my call, the banging on my front door was getting even louder. 911 said that she was dispatching police right away. She instructed me to stay on the line until they arrived. About 12 minutes into the call, the banging got more violent. Rattling pictures off the wall even. I thought for sure that they would break my door down at any moment. 911 asked me where I was located in the home and I told her. She asked me if I could hide somewhere. She told me not to put myself in danger. In that tiny moment, I felt enraged. No, I'm not going to hide. I'm not taking my eyes off my son's bedroom under any circumstance. Where are the cops? And besides, I lived in a small trailer and the only hiding place for an adult is my bedroom closet. I'd be easily found. So I just erupted over the phone, saying, Look, lady, I'm a single mom. I have no man, no gun, and no place to hide. If he breaks this door down, what am I supposed to do? Throw this knife at him? Where are the effing cops? She assured me again that the cops were on their way and stay on the line. More banging, but this time it moved to the actual side of the trailer, and it sounded like they were taking a baseball bat and beating against the outside of the trailer. At that moment, Chris started shrieking. I ran the few steps over into his room to check on him. The loud commotion had just pushed his fear gauge over the edge. He was screaming, crying incessantly under his bed. I quickly ascertained that he was physically okay and I returned back to the end of the hallway to check on the front door. As I was explaining to 911 that my son was okay, just scared, I noticed that the banging had suddenly stopped. I waited another minute or so, trying to listen out for any sign of further escalation, like a window breaking. All I could hear were sobs coming from my son's room. All in all, it took the cops 23 minutes to arrive, and by then, their perp had long gone. For reference, I live about 10 minutes away from the police station. 911 even called it in as an act of home invasion, and I was livid about the response time. My front door was made out of some type of metal, just a cheap generic trailer door, and it was now covered in dents. There were noticeable scratch marks on the locks, failed attempts at picking the deadbolt. The siding on the trailer was damaged where the perp had hit it with something. Given the history, I immediately suspected Ryan was the perp, and the police said since I didn't actually see the person, then they couldn't arrest him without an eyewitness. The most they could do was make a report, and they did end up canvassing the immediate area in case that he was on foot since I didn't see a vehicle in my driveway prior to this happening. 
However, there was no sign of him or anyone around and about. I deduced that he probably had parked nearby out of sight, that way his vehicle wouldn't be spotted or recognized at my home. My home was situated next to a thin patch of woods that has public access roads on the other side. I also am absolutely convinced that Ryan had nefarious plans for me that evening, but when he discovered my son was at home with me, via his terrified shrieking, he came to and bailed. He stopped trying to break into my home the moment my son inadvertently made his presence known. For whatever reason, Ryan always lit up when I talked about my son. He used to initiate conversations about Chris just to watch me dote over him. Looking back, I guess it was his morbid way of bonding with my child, and I think in his own warped way, he grew to care about him. So when he heard Chris scream, he decided not to follow through with whatever his plan was for me. I ended up taking a few days off of work because I was so shaken up. I stayed at my parents' house during that time because I was afraid to go home. My landlord had the damaged door replaced while I was gone, and realizing that I had a job and a life and that I couldn't stay gone forever, I knew that I had to go home. So I got a gun, a small caliber revolver, but it would do the job, and then I went home. I lived in that trailer for another four months before I saved up enough money to move. It was totally peaceful during those months, with no further events or altercations, but I just couldn't stand being there anymore. Since then, I have changed jobs, met someone special, gotten engaged, bought a house, and got a dog. No further sign of Ryan anywhere during any of these life changes, and it's been nearly seven years since any sign of him. Ryan seems to have disappeared out of my life in the same manner he first appeared, out of nowhere, and I couldn't be happier that he's gone. Hopefully, it stays that way. So I live in a compound and we have a gym in the community. I used to go at 2am six times a week. One day this guy walks in and starts working out and at the end of my session he says if I needed any gym advice that I should ask him. What was weird is he's really skinny while well, you can tell I've been gymming for a pretty long time. I didn't think much of it until a few days later and he appears again at the same time. For a whole year I've never seen him come at this time and he starts talking to me during my workout and we exchange Instagram accounts. I didn't think much of it at all. Maybe he recently moved into this compound and wants to meet people. Same day, he messaged me saying, I see some good chess progress, to which I replied thank you and that I appreciate it, and also didn't think much of it. For the next three weeks, he would try to initiate outings and gymming together, which I wasn't interested in, so... I avoided him and changed my gym time because I changed my sleep schedule. It was just kind of coincidental. Once again, I went to the gym at 9pm and he was already there, and I was kind of forced to have a conversation with him afterwards for like 10 minutes, and he said let's go for coffee, which I declined, saying my friends are waiting for me online, and I could see a disappointed look on his face. A few days later, he was driving into the compound and saw me walking back home, so he honks the car and initiates another conversation right outside my house. He talked about his uni work and how busy he is as I cut the conversation, saying that it was too humid so I'm going inside. The next day, he walks into the gym a few seconds after I did and we were chatting about random stuff, one of them being how I was buying these LED lights on Amazon and slowly, he started talking about praying and religion and what I think about it and whether I pray. I said I do have a relationship with God and then I pray in my own way, and he kept repeating some of my sentences, sighing right after, and it was so weird. So I put my earphones on and said that I'll listen to music, and I could tell that he was doing random workouts as if to wait for me to be done. He catches up to me as I'm leaving and started talking about the car parked out of my house and how I should see his car one day, which I agreed to. Literally right the next day, he calls me three times, which I don't pick up until the next day, where he called and I picked up in case I see him at the gym. I was preparing to go. I told him I was busy the day before, and he said, It's okay. I just wanted to tell you I left you some LED lights on your car. I couldn't relax until I made sure I gave them to you. To which I replied that you don't have to. 
I don't want them, as he kept insisting and saying it's nothing. Everything that has happened before this moment seemed weird, but not creepy. During the phone call, I felt so uneasy that I almost just hung up and blocked his phone number as he was becoming really obsessive, is all I can really describe it as. He said, what are you up to? To which I replied, not much, I might go to the gym later, but I was planning to go now, I just didn't want him to follow. To which he replied, oh cool, I'm doing some studying and researching some stuff. So I said, alright man, enjoy, and hung up. I went around my whole house, making sure all doors and windows are completely shut and locked and headed to the gym. And bam, he was there. We said hi to each other and I put my earphones on and completely avoided him until I finished. He followed and said, hey, you want to see my car now? Which I said, sure. I know I shouldn't have, but I did. The whole building is covered with 24-7 surveillance, so I went and saw his car in the basement floor, and as we got to it, he looked back at a guy that had just arrived there in this sort of bothered look. So he looked back at me and said, well, this is my car. I said, okay, cool, as I started stepping away. And he starts talking about his bike and how he wrecked it. It was next to the car, as if to get me back closer to the car. So I said, all right, well, I'll see you. And just as he said, wait, uh, let me walk you home. To which I refused as he gave me another weird look. I forgot to mention this guy's presence on Instagram is just super weird. He just posts about cars and selfies from up to a year ago and nothing about him before then. No name, no age. He told me that he was 18 and I'm 22. I have no idea how to act. Do I block this person and tell him I don't want to communicate with him? Do I stay in contact with him to make sure that they don't pull some weird stuff since they know where I live? Do I call the authorities? I'm sitting at home feeling like I'm being watched right now. Any advice would really help. When I was in fifth grade, I met Caitlin. I would stay over at her house constantly. Her mom was a drunk, that's a whole other story, and her dad locked himself away in a room to smoke and watch TV all the time. She has a sister who didn't come out of her room either. Her parents had a friend, we'll call him Keith, who would come over after the bars closed and leave before the morning. At night, we would be in her room playing or sleeping, and Keith would come in and immediately... Caitlin would get up and tell me that she'd be right back. Caitlin would always get Keith to leave her room with her and they would go watch a movie or a show on the couch. I was always so jealous that she got to watch movies late at night so sometimes I would come out to the living room to join them. She would always make it a point to leave room on the other side of her for me to sit. Over the years, we grew apart honestly and I didn't think much of it. I was young and didn't understand what was going on or I blocked it out. In high school, she started getting into some pretty rough stuff, and I saw marks on her wrist. When I confronted her to talk about it, she spilled what was really happening during those movies. This happened from 2nd grade to 7th. Once she told me, the memories all came back. She saved me, and I had no idea. And I could have helped, and instead, she wanted to protect me. I wish I had a beautiful ending, but she ended up telling her parents, and all they did was kick him out of their life and beat him up. Her parents became sober when she got into drugs. She became a dancer and an escort. She got married and had children, but apparently still uses. I got a life that I am proud of because she let me. I always feel this sense of guilt, but I promised to do good for her. She gave up her life and innocence so I could live unharmed. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. 
Thanks so much, friends. And remember, it's just another drug bust Monday.